you probably recognize this, you might even have one, this is the SciTech ProFlight yoke system. Uh, it's not the system, I don't have to draw a cord with this, this is just a yoke. Now, if you're in the market for one of these, you, you should regard that description, ProFlight in particular, as aspirational, <laughs> rather as a description of the quality to expect from a yoke such as this. Uh, these are very popular but uh, they're very popular for one good reason, which is that at this end of the market th there's very little choice. There's basically a choice of two different yolks. That's this one and the CH products, which comes in two different flavours, the CH Flight Yolk and the CH Eclipse. But we're looking at SciTech today. These are, in truth, cheaply manufactured. Uh, I was going to say shoddy. They're not shoddy, but they're cheaply manufactured down to a price sold, I think, at an inflated price, and they don't work all that well in practice. Now, there's lots of uh, well-documented problems with this yoke that I'm not going to go into here. I, ha I have made other videos about my opinions of this yoke, if you want to read about them. But, I, I, you know, I'm not here to do a hatchet job. I'm here to rescue it. What we're going to do is, in fact, we're going to look at one of the major, the major downfall of this yoke which really makes it unworkable, in, in my view, as a flight yoke. And that's the, the elevator action. Um, the problem with the elevator action is the design of the yoke, if you open it up and investigate, pretty much guarantees that if you put any aileron deflection on at all, you get binding in the pitch axis. Now, if you're not in agreement with that, well, you know, great, you'd be happy with your yoke and uh, you're not, probably not going to be interested in the rest of this video. But what I'm going to do, I mean, there's lots of different videos around and uh, tutorials on how to fix or improve the action of this yoke. Usually to do with taking out the springs, adding bungee cords or elastic bands and so on. We're going to look at a radical way to fix this in this video. I'm now I'm going to take the opportunity as well of lengthening the shaft on this yoke. I'm going to lengthen the shaft significantly for reasons which will become apparent in later videos. That's all I'll say for now. Now we've got two separate tasks here. We're going to look at them in sequence. The first one is to take the yoke body apart. Now all the workings of this yoke are actually in the upper part of it. So what we need to do is turn it over and then we're going to take off, take out all these screws here and then we can just lift the bottom plate off. There's nothing attached to the bottom plate. It's just a shell of plastic. And to do that we need to access 14 deeply embedded screws. So you're going to need a long bladed screwdriver with a Phillips uh, crosshead on it. Uh, and it's got to be narrow enough to poke down these holes. Now, just a word of caution here, and this, this applies right throughout the dismantling and reassembly of the yoke. Everything's held together with very, very cheap self-tapping screws. They're quite up to the job. They hold the yoke. I mean, nothing I say about the, the screws really should be construed as criticism. This thing's made in a factory. It's not designed to be dismantled and reassembled. Uh, and when it's together, the screws that they use, cheap though they are, hold it together quite adequately. So, um, so really, we're asking for trouble by taking it apart. But uh, nevertheless, we, we are taking it apart. You've got to be very careful with these screws because you can mangle the, the head very easily. And if you mangle the head, you won't be able to get it back in or get it out. You'll have to source replacement screws. So just something to be aware of. I've got most of the screws out at the minute. I'm just going to take out the, um, the last couple. So as I said, once we've done that, that top plate, or the bottom plate, in fact, because we're upside down, just lifts straight off. Um, if you've not opened one of these before, be prepared for a bit of mayhem. There's this Everything in here is smothered in this horrible Vaseline gel kind of stuff. So I'll just give you a quick look inside of this. You needn't worry about it falling apart. Everything's secured in there. If I hold it up, I don't want to go through this in great detail, but you can see the shaft goes all the way through and it slides up and down. There's a spring here that resists that. That's going to be completely irrelevant. That action, as you will shortly see, 
we have no interest in that. Now the aileron action is another matter. You can see this fairly complicated set of cantilevers and uh, little devices that basically operate a potentiometer right down here for the um, aileron axis and that is resisted by the tension of this spring here which works in a sort of dual action. You know the engineer in me is kind of fascinated by that. <laughs> it, gives a, it gives a detente in the middle which isn't too intrusive. We're not going to muck about with it. Well I say that. At the moment the plan is not to muck about with that. We're going to live with that. Um, the detente in pitch is a bit more intrusive. Nothing much else to say about this except just to point out that at the end of this shaft right at the bottom here there's a very hefty bundle of wires comes out. That goes all the way through the shaft well it goes from this controller board here, this is a joystick controller board all the way through the shaft up into the handle. Now we're going to see the other end of that bundle of wires in a little while and uh, we've got to work with that. These are tiny very thin wires so they are delicate. What I've done just for the moment is I've put the shell back together loosely just so we can uh, concentrate on the handle. The handle is held together by a further tw oh, is it 12 screws, 10 screws or 12 screws and these are on the back side of the handle here. You can see a couple of them, same size screws, they're deeply recessed within the handle. I've taken most of them out, I've put two back in to hold it together, I can't remember which, <laughs> which two it is. Hang on a minute, that's one there. So we've got the handle apart. Now, when you do this first time, you've got to be careful because uh, you can't just lift the handle off. What you're going to find is, uh, because you've got buttons and switches on here, you've got a, a whole constellation of buttons and switches. You've got buttons and an LCD display on the front there. So what you're going to find is three different things. Well, three different things initially. When you pull it off, now I've disconnected all these things, so I'm not in such a, uh, a pickle here. When you first pull this off, you're only going to get it off about this far and there's three bundles of wires. Now I've just taped them on temporarily here with bits of um, masking tape so I can reassemble it. But this one, and, and thankfully they connect onto, um, for the most part, onto the front face of the handle with these little, I don't know what you call these, but little plugs and pins on here. So, so you just got to carefully work these off either with your fingers or with a screwdriver. And uh, so one from the centre, one from this bundle of switches, there's a little circuit board inside of there. And uh, another one at, at this side. So you take off those three plugs and you end up with uh, three floating wire bundles. Now the problem there is that's not quite the whole story. These uh, two switches on the back side of the of the handles, that's a one push switch and then the mode switch which is a three position switch. Those are connected by a further uh, four wires on this side, on the, on the right hand side and I think it's three, sorry two wires on the left hand side. Now honestly the simplest thing to do there is just to cut those wires. Cut them kind of in the middle. They're about an inch and a half long, something like that. Just get your wire cutters. This is what I recommend. Cut them cleanly towards the middle. Um, that's probably the safest way to separate the handle completely and it's easily repairable. Now you're gonna um, given that I'm going to extend the shaft, I'm going to be cutting all these wires anyway, and you know I, I know I'm going to have to be soldering, uh, soldering them back together after lengthening them. So actually repairing these ones in the same way is going to be trivial to do. So that's what I recommend. Then you can take the handle right apart. Let's just talk a little bit about extending the shaft. Um, now the best thing. This is a one inch or twenty five millimeter shaft made of well, stainless steel. They're, they're big on telling people it's made of stainless steel. That's irrelevant in my estimation. Honestly, it doesn't uh, doesn't 
doesn't make the shaft work any better. The best thing to do if you're going to extend this, if you choose to, is to try and find a tube that's pretty much the same, well exactly the same size. And the reason for that is we can remove the yoke handle and then we can remount it on the, a new tube using exactly the same mechanism and then we have to find a way of joining the tubes together. What I've discovered, let me just get that out. If you go to the bathroom department, kitchens and bathrooms department of your local DIY store, you can find a one inch tube, a 25mm tube. This is made of, uh, of presumably aluminium, I don't know, is it? No, steel. Um, and it's and it's precisely matches the original yoke shaft. Well, I say precisely. It's not the same colour. This is white. <laughs> Most uh, people want white. This is this is meant for like a shower rail or a uh, towel rail or something. You know, I'm not going to make the shaft of the yoke probably quite this long. <laughs> I haven't decided yet. We'll go into that later. So what I'm going to show you now is how to remove the handle from the yoke. We've got two things to remove. We've got Basically four screws, again they're very cheap, in fact these are even cheaper and nastier self-tapping screws, kind of with a very wide head. Uh, it looks like a washer, but it's not a washer, it's part of the head. Now I've removed, I've only got two of them in here at the minute, and they hold on this little fascia plate through which the bundle of wires passes. I think that's just intended to protect the wires from being damaged or something. I'm not quite sure about that. Then that little face plate just comes free and we can just let that hang on the on the bundle of wires for now. And then underneath that you can now see the the end of the stainless steel shaft just just in sort of cross section there. And what, what's revealed is we've got four slightly larger versions of the same screw around the periphery. Again I've got two of them are removed and two of them are in there. Those are the things that are actually holding the back plate of the handle onto the shaft. So if we take those off. So once you've removed those, you'll find that that handle just pops off. And then it's uh, in the way, <laughs> flopping about while you do the next bit. And what you're going to see is, hopefully on the vid video you're going to see this, that uh, on the end of the shaft we've got this plastic mounting plate. That's a fairly hefty thing uh, and it's held, it, I mean basically it just slides onto the shaft, it's a snug fit, but then there's a, a steel pin that goes all the way through the shaft from one side to the other. So there's a hole in, hole in the shaft, that pin's about five millimeters in diameter and what you need to do is it's a snug fit, you need to um, carefully ease it out, it'll go either way, it's, it's, um, it's just free, free floating really. We've got it out now, little steel pin. And then you should find that the collar, we'll call it, comes straight off and you can, if you can thread the wires and that little face plate through, you can take it right off the yoke. And then just putting the yoke to one side for a minute. If we get our replacement shaft, we should find that that just slides. It's a snug fit. This is a, this is a 25 millimeter shaft. It's, it's actually painted or powder powder coated or something. So that's probably you know the thickness is not completely um, uniform. But there you go. That that's pretty much on the shaft there and that's a snug fit. All we're going to have to do is drill a hole through through there and insert the pin. And then we can uh, mount every mount the handle back onto here. You can see it's at a sort of raked angle that gives you the um, the right sort of outcome. So um, I think that's all we'll say for now. Okay, so time to introduce you to the next piece of the puzzle. These two pieces of furniture I have here on my right and left holding up my workbench. These are just cheap, um, don't know what you call them, like little side units from Argos. 
and the important part for our purposes is this little shelf here. You notice this slides in and out very smoothly and the reason for that is it's suspended on these two simple runner systems. These are tracks running on ball bearings and they make for a very smooth low friction action. And we're going to use that. We're going to steal these runners, we're going to take them off this shelf here. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take this, uh, this, is a, just a, this is a shelf out of <laughs> a piece of kitchen furniture I believe, which I just found lying around. Uh, it's, it's made of chipboard, which means it's very heavy. That's going to work in our favour as well. Now it's about the right size to take the yoke and I'll just I'll just try and show you roughly the proportions of this. We're going to mount the yoke underside, which is this part, on this piece of wood. And we're going to have two battens on either side. And we're going to mount those rails on the, on the side. So effectively what we're going to have, if I take away the piece of wood for now, we're going to have the yoke I'll just uh, stick that together. Of course the handle's missing at the minute, you have to uh, use your imagination here. Instead of the elevator action being provided by the yoke shaft sliding in and out, that's going to be fixed and the entire body of the yoke is going to slide backwards and forwards, which seems a little bit wacky, but this is going to be out of sight, so we need to worry about that. And the advantage we have there is we're completely losing that very shoddy and not very effective elevator action that, that relies on this shaft mechanism. What we're going to do is we're going to pull the shaft all the way uh, back like this. We're going to stick a, I don't know, probably a block of wood or something in, in there. I'll just do it, sort of half do it for now. Uh, this, so this is going to be solid and fixed. It's still going to be able to rotate from side to side to get the aileron action. So we're going to have to do something clever here just so we don't uh, impede that too much. And then as I said the whole unit is going to move backwards and forwards. We're going to obviously to get the tension on that and the spring action we're going to need to use some kind of spring or elast elasticity. We've got a bunch of bungee cords here. These are small bungees. This is going to be a bit of an experiment. Obviously I don't know you know, kind of exactly how the, the tension is going to work out. But I've got a whole bunch of these small bungees which should allow me to tune that quite precisely. So that's another part of the jigsaw. Now of course the other part of that is by disabling the shaft we're going to have to find some different way of operating the potentiometer for the elevator action. Now this is going to be difficult to see here, I might try and do this in close up. Basically you've got this, the, the potentiometer is here and as this arm here rotates in that orientation, you might see it moving there and it rotates the pot using a little gear system. So what we need to do is we need to retain this arm uh, and then we've got to find some way of moving it as the body of the yoke moves. So all we're going to do is we're going to take off this, this little piece that's attached to the shaft. That engages with that arm. So we have to find a way of removing that. We'll remove the spring mechanism obviously. And then all we've got to do is connect some kind of push rod. i use this ruler as an example, as a sort of uh, model of that. Some sort of push rod to the end of that lever. Have it project out of the end of the case here, and so as we move the case, that will move the potentiometer. So that's simple in principle. I think I'll probably just use a dowel for that. I've got a piece of dowel somewhere, and uh, just contrive some way of attaching it at this end, and then just attaching it to a fixed object on the wooden base at the other end. And so here's the result. This is the basic structure complete. We've got the yoke mounted on 
the sliding rails and that's pretty smooth and because we've used that quite heavy piece of chipboard we've got a nice weighty feel to this there's no bungees or, or tension on it yet but it's got a nice set of inertia a nice feeling of inertia which is going to hopefully stand us in good stead for how it feels in use now there's a lot of travel in this we're not going to need this much travel the standard travel of this yoke is about three and a half inches if I remember rightly so we only want to use three and a half inches of that sliding action in fact when we look at how to attach our push rod to the end of that crank the crank that connects to the potentiometer it's actually obstructed by a piece of the structure so we might lengthen that slightly there is a consequence of lengthening that crank which is that the stroke that we need to achieve full deflection of that potentiometer is, is going to increase. Now as long as that doesn't increase beyond maybe four and a little, maybe four and a half inches we should be fine. In fact I measured my elite yoke that has a four inch stroke. Next thing to do is to think about that push rod and crank mechanism and then we'll be pretty much done. Uh, we can go on to lengthening the shaft. I've removed all the bits that are superfluous pretty much and uh, this is the crank that we're going to need to drive in the elevators and I've just removed that, that crank comes off from that position there. Well we're getting closer, we've got most of the internals done in fact it is done, I just need to do a little bit of tweaking. So what you should see here is we've got the crank is now in place. I've extended it with a piece of aluminium and I've done a little bit of careful shaping of the end just so it clears all the obstacles. I've had to use a bit of um, judicious filing as well, filing away some of the plastic bits. And you'll see that I've got a dowel hooked up to the end of that crank now. And it nice and smoothly operates the potentiometer. The other thing that you'll see if you if you look closely I've got this block which is now preventing the shaft from moving in and out which was the old elevator action and that's about it really. It's fairly simple in principle. There are a few wrinkles in the implement, implementation. Most notably this if you watch uh, this rod as I pull it in and out because that crank tip doesn't travel in a straight line, it actually travels on an arc that makes this setup a little bit more complicated and in particular the exit hole at the end has to be elongated in fact if you just watch that dowel down at the bottom here where it leaves the case while I operate it, you should see it wobbles about across the cycle The other wrinkle is remember we want to preserve the shaft rotation for the aileron controls. So I've tried to make this point, although it's pressing on the end of the shaft to stop it moving in this direction, I've tried to make it as friction or as low friction as possible. And the way I've settled on to do that is that's a coach bolt with a domed head and that's pressing against the end of the shaft. The end of the shaft has got this rubber, kind of rubbery cap on. So it's pressing against that and it's embedded in a hole in this wood block and at the end of that hole there's, well I, I wanted to use a ball bearing, I didn't have a ball bearing but there's a little metal, I think it's a nut, it's a very small nut, so it's metal rubbing against metal. So actually it turns quite, quite freely in there. Um, if you were looking at this sufficiently close up you would see, I hope you would see, that the coach bolt is actually turning with the shaft. And so back to the completed units. What I'm going to do first is show you the underside. Just added some bump stops for the action at each end. And then if we look at the top side 
you're going to see I've got some bungees on there as well which are providing the springiness. I'll just change the camera angle so you can... So we're back again to the completed unit and what's new? Well obviously we're still missing the handle but we've got the bungee cords on for an initial stab at giving some tension in the yoke. That's working reasonably well. So we're in the centre position, we can pull it forward and back and we get what feels like a nice resistance, kind of smooth. I'm not really going to be able to tell how well this works until I've got the handle on and I'm flying it. But you can see the general method here. I've got two sets of springs, one pulling this way, one pulling this way. There's no sense of detente to the extent that there is any central position. It's just the balance point between the two sets of bungees. The other thing that's different is the crank push rod, if I think we'll call it, comes out of the back and just using this screw is anchored at the rear of the frame. And so you can see as I push and pull that operates the elevator action nice and smoothly. You get, well, I'm getting some clicking noises from these bungees. I've, I've, the way this is set at the moment, these bungees at the extremes, the opposing bungees go slack. And so you get some clicking. That, I don't really like that noise. You, you probably realise this frame is bigger than it needs to be. I could chop everything off here and just re-engineer that to be smaller. I'm not going to do that for now, partly because it's just it's just not necessary. But also I wanted to leave a space here. I had an idea initially that I might put some weight on here, like a, a brick or something like that, just to give it a bit more inertia. Um, again, this is something that I'm going to have to tune once I get it up and running. You know, it's one thing sitting here just pushing and pulling it like this, it's another thing trying to fly it. It feels kind of weighty there, but putting a brick on there might make it feel weightier still. So we'll, we'll see, that's a work in progress. So for now I'm happy with the elevator action. I've reassembled the yoke handle and had a go, brief go flying this around and the results are very encouraging. But we're going to look at doing the extension of the shaft now. So as I said we've got the steel pipe. This is one inch pipe, 25 millimeter, exact match for the existing pipe. And I've cut myself a piece off. So the question is how to join these two things together. Obviously the, I can't position this exactly at the moment because the wire bundle is in the way. I'm going to have to extend the wires in a while. I looked at several different ways of joining this. There's low tech and high tech ways, well not high tech, but there's different variations of low tech ways to do this. You know, the absolute simplest way would be to get a, a block of wood and uh, drill a one inch 25 millimeter hole through it and insert both ends into there and then perhaps pin it with a bolt through or a couple of bolts through. Everything else is a variation on that. What I settled on is I've got some of this aluminium channel, uh, I don't know what you call this, but this is uh, it's a very stiff because it's channeled, it's one and a half millimeter aluminium. The diameter of the hole is 20 uh, what is the diameter of the hole? I can't remember. I was going to say 27 millimetres, that can't be true because it's a tight fit. Well it is 27 but maybe it's 27 external diameter. So 27, so 24 millimetre internal diameter. That's very convenient. And it's very convenient because when you lay this over the pipe, it's tight. If you press it in, I won't do that because I might not get it out again. <laughs> I'll do it on this, uh, can you see that? If you press it on there, it will actually snap on and stay there and that gives you a nice tight joint and the plan is to cut it's a very tight joint uh, the plan is to cut and I've actually done this I've cut two equal lengths of this this is 10 centimeters long and to join the shaft on each side. So we're going to get, effectively when those are pushed on, we're going to get a box section and then to put a 
Well, there's, there's two things I'm going to do here. One is to I clamp the whole thing using a hose clamp uh, at each side of the joint. That in itself, I suspect, will make it rigid enough that it won't need any extra support. Now the problem is we're going to be twisting this and there's going to be quite significant forces on this. Uh, that's not That clamping is not going to be sufficient to convey the twisting action across the joint. So we're going to need to put a, a pin through there. So I'll drill a hole through, put, uh, I've got some 40mm machine screws. If I put one of those either side of the joint, that should be enough to make a very secure joint that will convey the twisting forces as required and it's not going to be too obtrusive it's going to be it's not going to be pretty but it's not going to be completely ugly so we don't need to drill a hole through the existing shaft because we have one remember the collar goes on the end of the shaft at the moment and this pin goes through it we're going to extend this out to the end of the new shaft but in the meantime we can put one of those bolts through that pin hole and we can do that without fear of damaging the wires. The wires go down through a plastic channel that goes all the way into the interior of this. So that's really all I need to talk about for now. The next thing I will do, the next thing I will have to do really, is to take these wire bundles and painstakingly extend them. How many wires have we got here? That's going to be a bit of a pain. Let me just count these up. Uh, there's about 26 wires there, you know, there's no option really but to chop them off here, solder uh, inserts onto there, 26 wires, that's going to be 52 solder joints, and then that uh, new bundle of wires is going to pass up through the, the extension. And I think what I'm going to need to do is, because I don't know which wires which, you know, there's a big mess of colours here, I'm going to just have to do cut these one at a time, do the soldering. So 52 solder connections, that's not really too much in the grand scheme of things. But it's the next hurdle really I've got to get over. So the wiring extension is now done. Here we go. There's a bit of a performance. Not technically difficult, but definitely fiddly. These are really skinny wires, so you have to take a lot of care and it takes a lot of patience. And uh, the wires I've used to link them with, it's much thicker wire. These are the, this is the wire I had around. This is, uh, you, you do have to start to pay attention to the thickness of the, the bundle you're going to end up with. This will go through the tube, no problem. But when we get up to the handle end, you know, it's maybe going to cause us problems rooting the wires. But, uh, so just, just something to else to bear in mind really. Well we're just about there, we've got the shaft extension done, we've got the handle mounting fitted and so the next thing to do is just to reassemble the whole thing and pretty much we'll be ready to try it out. Okay we are done, it's all back together. Reassembled the yoke, haven't tested it yet but everything looks ship shape, feels good. I've put the bungees back on, I've tweaked these to get a good compromise tension. So the only thing left really is to plug it in and uh, fly it around. So that's what we'll do.